Thank you so much. It's Pat. Hi, everybody. Hi. I'm Maggie. I'm Denise. Maggie, do you remember when Dad used to say, kids today have too much time, too much money, and no responsibility. And I'm going to give you no time, no money, and a lot of responsibility. And we were like, gee, thanks, Dad. That sounds like a lot of fun. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we had terrific parents that instilled in us at an early age the art of responsibility. And they did it through an interesting technique called the job jar. So Denise and I have two other sisters as well. So we had four job jars set up in our kitchen. And every Saturday, my mom and dad would put chores inside the job jar that we would have to complete by the following Saturday in order to get our allowance. And the job jars taught us a lot of lessons. I mean, in fact, we could select our chore, and if we didn't really like it, we could negotiate it. So it taught us the art of bartering. And these, the, they were like our scorecards, just like report cards, because it really was about goal achievement. You had to complete your chore by the end of the week. And we never, ever thought about what happens if we don't complete them, because we were taught at a very early age that results matter. And it was a pay-for-performance system, because that's how we earned our allowance. <laughs> And it was a team sport, too, because we would take all the jobs out every Saturday. After about the first couple Saturdays, I would, the, you know, the novelty wore off. And then we'd just look at all the chores that we had to do. We'd start to do our bartering back and forth. But we could really see the big picture of everything that had to get done in our household on a weekly basis. So it really taught us not just to think about the small things you got to do, but what the big impact was. And they helped shape our lives. When you think about the lessons learned, it shaped our career paths and our leadership styles. So let's do some lessons learned. We'll show you how we use the job jar. What did you get? I got risk taking. What did I you get? I got business planning. I want risk taking. No. No, I want risk taking. So right. you take business planning, but you can go first. Oh, well, thank you very much. <laughs> so <laughs> when I think about business planning, I think about when we were young. <laughs> I was 12 years old, and I wanted to get my ears pierced. And so I had to put a business plan together for my parents to convince them that there was value associated with me getting my ears pierced. <laughs> Needless to say, the first time I was shot down, they said no. They said it's too expensive, and we're really not quite sure what the value. And of course, my father, in his infinite wisdom, said, well, if you were meant to have holes in your ears, you would have been born with them. <laughs> Remember screwback earrings? I know. We had to wear them for a year. So I had to regroup. I went back and I thought, OK, how can I make this value added? I, I said, aha, my sister Denise. So I went to Denise and I said, why don't you get your ears pierced with me? I can d do this two for the price of one. We could share earrings. And I could put a plan together that they'd approve. So Denise lent me her ears. We got our ears pierced because I got this approved, and all was well from the business plan perspective. So it taught us early on to have a clear vision, to think about what the benefits and the risks are, and the measurements of success. And if you don't succeed at first, you try, try again. Speaking of which, our youngest sister, Andrea, wanted a horse when she was young. <laughs> and it took her a year and a half to get that horse. But every week on my mother's grocery shopping list, she put one, one horse, horse, any kind. It didn't matter. <laughs> so we've been used to business planning. I know in my career, I do a lot of business plans, and it's really helped me uh, from what I learned when I was young, including an $8.6 billion acquisition I did for our company just three years ago. Woohoo! And uh, triple the size of Frontier. So risk taking. So now I have. Risk-taking. So when, when I was in high school, it was the early 70s, there were two women's sports, cheerleading or baton twirling. <laughs> I didn't make the cheerleaders, and I was devastated. So I went out for baton twirling. But I didn't want to just twirl a baton. I wanted to do something that wasn't ordinary. I wanted to twirl fire. And it was the first calculated risk. And I remember. I had to practice and prepare for this execution on the halftime show. And my mother, instead of telling me I couldn't do it, which I can't, was not in our vocabulary, it was how can you, 
My mother sewed a flame retardant outfit and then stood on the football field with a blanket, just in case the calculated risk did not work out. But it did. And we、it、called her Silver Girl all Silver through girl, high school. Girl, She girl. was Silver yes, Girl on the yes, field. Yes, yes, yes. So anyway, that calculated risk taught me a lot of value in terms of how to do something that wasn't average, that wasn't ordinary, and it was worth it for the pleasure that it brought the crowd. Now, fast forward to Campbell Soup Company, and last year I made three acquisitions. One was the acquisition of Bolt House Farms, which is the largest acquisition in our company's 144-year history. And Bolt House Farms, for those who know it or don't know it, is a leader in super. Premium, fresh, healthy beverages, salad dressings, and carrots. And skeptics said, "Carrots, Denise, really?" I said, "No, packaged fresh. It's a twelve billion dollar category, growing at six to seven percent per year." And Campbell's deserves a place in the fresh food business. I fundamentally believe that it was a calculated risk, and I'm still twirling fire. <laughs> So back to the job jar. Would you get innovation? So did I. Innovation. You go first. Okay. So why does she always do this to me? So innovation. When I think about innovation, and I think about us being young,、um, I think about continuous innovation. You know, we've all heard incredible people on this stage talk about breakthrough innovation, but there's also continuous innovation that's important because for sustainability. You have to continue to improve and change in the environment you're in. As Denise mentioned, her company's 144 years old. I'm going on 80 at Frontier, so we have to innovate constantly. And one of the innovation lessons we learned early on is when I was about seven and Denise was eight, we used to watch a show on television called Wonderama. Now, most of you in this room have never heard of that show, but it was a children's show. And every year at springtime, they would have kits for carnivals that you could write in and order, and you could do a carnival to raise money for muscular dystrophy, which Denise and I decided to do. So we got our kit. We were so excited, and we did posters and we rode our bikes around in neighborhoods and put signs up all over the place, and we recruited our neighborhood friends to come and work the carnival with us, and we did penny games. Uh, and we raised $25 that first carnival. That's a lot of pennies. And we learned the art of advertising, marketing, project management, persuasion, and continuous improvement. Because we did those carnivals for five years, and we raised more money every year. We did it. And we learned to make a profit and make a difference. Absolutely. Well, innovation. I remember that my dinner table, your dinner table, was the perfect focus group for my father, who was an executive at AT&T, and he brought to that dinner table all kinds of test market ideas and new products, like the Trimline phone or the Princess phone, which were innovations in their day. Call waiting, and it wasn't just show and tell on the part of my father; it was actually debate and input. It was really. Great training. We didn't know it at the time, but my father was a visionary, and he said to us, "I believe someday the world is going to open up to women, and I want you to be prepared for that." Because my dad thought that women should have a seat at the table, and he was right. Absolutely, but we also had pink princess phones too. So yeah. <laughs> so why don't you wrap up with some give back here? Yes, one of the things that is really important,、uh, we believe, is sharing and giving back some of these life lessons, even if they're life lessons from a job jar.、Uh, and one of the things I'll pass on is the importance of. Creating a plan for yourself, and the observation is, and it really came from an insight I had in my career, and it was, you know, we're strategic about brands and we're strategic about companies, but we're not strategic about ourselves. And if you step back and look at your your career as a plan, it's where have you been, where are you going, what do you want to be, and how do you get there, and then who can help you. And building relationships is the second key tip. And building relationships is your ability will get you so far, but your relationships will get you the rest of the way. And my sister Maggie is one of the best networkers and relation builders I know. And networking is working. It's not fooling around. It's really important. And then the, finally, 
I went to Toledo one on vacation. Has anybody been to Toledo on vacation? <laughs> no, there's nothing to do, so I wrote a personal mission. It was inspired by the book, Seven Habits of Highly Effective People by Stephen Covey. And my mission is to serve as a leader, live a balanced life, and apply ethical principles to make a significant difference. That was 1994, it hasn't changed, because part of leadership is knowing who you are and what you stand for so others can follow you. And so, I'm paying it forward and giving back to pay my parents back for all the support that they gave me. And our parents have been terrific in our lives. There's no doubt about that. And Denise was so eloquent on that. The only thing I'm going to add is one of the things that I focus a lot on is making sure that I advance women. I'm in a position I can do that. I sit on corporate boards. I run a Fortune 500 company. And I believe you bring women along. When I joined Frontier a little over nine years ago, there were no women on our board. Today, we have five women on our board and two African-American men. Campbell's so, too, five. Yep, so it's good. Yeah, woo -hoo. So 60% of my board members are diverse. When I joined the company at that same time, there was one woman at a vice president level or above out of the top 100 people in the company. Today, if you look at the top seven women in our company, uh, top, top seven people, four are women. And if you look at my leadership in regional operations, 50% of all the people at P&L responsibility are women in our company. Yeah. And I'm, I'm also very proud that I am one of the co-founders of a group called Women in America, which is, takes place in the New York area, where there's about 30 or 40 uh, women executives. Denise is part of the group, too, because, of course, yeah. I roped her into it. <laughs> but we mentored young it. women in their late 20s through their 40s to help in their mid-career to accelerate that career. We do a two-year class with each group, and I'm so thrilled because we're starting our third class in February with 40 magnificent mentees. And that, it's reverse mentoring, too. We learn Yeah, we from learn the so women. much from them, too, which is really great. Yeah. But I do want to end by saying, the most important mentor in my life is my sister, Denise, oh, and I love her oh. for that. I love you, sis. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, everybody. <laughs>